Hey man, welcome back to the Super Divorce Supercast. Nicholas Villars here, aka Super Diverse. We've got uh, several games we're going to talk about today. Games I played throughout the past week. That's what we're going to jump into first, first, firstly. And we're going to start on last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, I played a game called Ghost in the Washing Machine. Got this game off itch.io. And uh, from a creative team, if you want to call them that, they're called Fox Dog Studios. They describe themselves as IT consultants who accidentally started making live comedy shows with technology. Hmm. So they're not strictly game developers, but they do develop games. They've made several of them that I'll also kind of tell you about here. But uh, um, as far as their live comedy shows go, you can join in using your cell phone. They like to incorporate technology into their live comedy shows. Um, They have the audience interact with them. They play games. They control robot chefs. That's something they've done. Robot chefs during their live comedy shows. Controlled by the audience with their cell phones. You can fire sausage cannons. If you've ever wanted to fire a sausage cannon... Keep an eye out for Fox Dog Studios and their next live performance. You might be able to fire a sausage cannon using your cell phone at their comedy show. They also make music. And as programmers, they consider themselves experts at creating interactive exhibitions. They also like to do software development and um, some... uh, invoicing systems it's all directly from their website straight from the horse's mouth so like I said keep an eye out for them if you'd like to uh, check out Fox Dog Studios the creators of Ghost in the Washing Machine they have almost 20 live shows listed on their calendar right now if you happen to be in the UK through July Between now and July in the UK, if you happen to be there, go and check out a Fox Dog Studios program and uh, fire some sausage cannons. You can also follow Fox Dog Studios on Twitter, at Fox Dog Studios. Check out their website, foxdogstudios.com. Lloyd and Pete. It's a two-man creative team. Lloyd and Pete. I was saying they also made some other games uh, I've got them uh, I've got a few listed here I've written a few down they created weasel words a typing of the dead clone with taxidermy weasels bulldozer by the sea where you um, save your fish family from drying out by digging holes and then flooding them and putting your fish friends in there. Caterpillar Cowboy. Wrap your caterpillar body around loose critters at the ranch. But also watch out for the law. Delivery Derby. Deliver packages. Offerlings. Fix customers' problems by sacrificing offerlings. I'm not sure what an offer- offering is. But you have to sacrifice them to fix the customer's problems. You can play a game called Bunyan where you feed the character Bunyan pieces of tofu until he's a big boy. There's a game that they made called Avoid Zeros where you move left and right to not hit the flying zeros on the screen. The, the zeros will be flying at you and you have to move left and right to dodge them. You can uh, play this festive Christmas game called Middle Class Christmas Carol about a dog at Christmas. So how about Ghost in the Washing Machine? It took me about six minutes to complete this one. Uh, You start on a foggy city street. 
could be a nice London street, since they are from the UK. Maybe that's what they had in mind. Nice foggy street. You go into the washing machine store as the technician, kind of a dumpy, frumpy, middle-aged fellow. Perhaps down on his luck a little bit. And what you have to do is you have to hit the keys on your keyboard that flash up on your service device in order to fix the washing machine. So it's kind of like a quick time event, a QTE game. You walk up to a washing machine that needs fixed. You begin the fixing process. And then your little, I don't know what these things are called. It's like a handheld device, some sort of meter you know, with a screen on it that you would hook up to a washing machine. And you look at that screen, a letter will appear on it. Say the letter K, for example, appears on your service device. Then you have to tap K on your keyboard very quickly indeed before the time runs out. You have a time meter, like a green bar, I think. I can't remember if it was actually green, but a, a bar, as soon as you tap the key, it resets to a full position and starts running out again. And if you don't hit the next key in time, say the letter L is next. After you've hit K, letter L pops up. Timer starts running down, you have to hit letter L before time runs out. And if you don't do that, then you don't fix the machine and you lose. You lose the game. You don't want to lose the game. And you don't want to make too many mistakes either. Because at the end of the game, they give you a grade. I scored a uh, letter B grade for my efforts. Because I made a few mistakes, a few fumbles with my keyboard. Because some of the washing machines are harder to fix than others. And that, that timer starts ticking down. You get a little nervous. Letter E flashes up there. You accidentally hit F, you know, or R or something close by, and you're fumbling. Because I, uh, you know, I can, I can type pretty well when I'm not thinking about it. But, and I mean, and I mean without looking at my keyboard. And I never learned exactly how to, what do they call that, the home keys position you had to learn back in typing class. I never did that shit. Uh, that was always annoying to me. I'm pretty quick with typing as long as uh, the pressure's not on. And the pressure was on in this game. So I, you know, I was looking at the keyboard more than I would normally have to because normally if you make a mistake when you're typing, you just delete it and continue on. But in this case, if I made a mistake, if I got too cocky, and didn't want to check out my finger positions, then you make a mistake, you get penalized by the game, and you lose the game. And you don't want to lose the game, especially when you're uploading your videos to YouTube for people to watch them and get enjoyment out of. And maybe they're looking to you for inspiration. Maybe they're looking to your channel and your video for information on how to complete a game. And if that's the case, you can't you can't just have a montage of yourself screwing up. That's embarrassing and it's not helpful for your viewers. So anyhow, um, you got to fix the machines and you rarely see, uh what well, I don't know if I want to say rarely, you never really see any ghosts in this game. The washing machines when you walk up to the ones that need fixed They'll have kind of like a glow emanating from them. Like a, imagine there's like an orb of light that is inside the washing machine. Some sort of color light. And you can see it kind of glowing. And I guess maybe that's that's supposed to be the ghost. That's the ghost caught in the machine, in the washing machine. But it's not like there was a scary, spooky ghost that you encountered or ghosts. There was nothing creepy about it. It was, it was a quirky and funny game. I enjoyed it. It was quick. It was, you know, um, I would like an expanded version. I would like a version where 
Maybe you get to uh, earn cash when you fix the machines. And then there's a store or two that you can visit. Maybe upgrade your technician's outfit. Buy him some funny costumes that he can wear. Maybe go to the pub. Because that's part of the the story of the game and the very short story that we have here. You're trying to complete all your work so you can go back home. You can catch a bus and then meet your boss I think it's your boss. It's the guy who's kind of talking to you throughout the game. Sort of the narrator. But um, he tells you if you wrap up quickly, then you guys can, uh, just the two of you, head out and get a, a couple of pints and and uh, a steak dinner after work. And you finally do finish work at 4 a.m., though it's completely light outside. You never had any hint that it was nighttime. When you finish work at 4 a.m., your boss tells you, then um, he's like, go ahead and catch your train. And you don't get to see the visit to the pub. You don't get to see the steak dinner. I thought that was a little disappointing. So maybe a fleshed out Ghost in the Washing Machine Part 2 would be a nice entry into the Fox Dog Studios Pantheon. Anyway, that's that was my time with Ghost in the Washing Machine. That that pretty much covers the entire experience. It was a quick play, like I said, about six minutes or so to get through, front to back. Uh, played it right in the browser. So if you would like to try it, go and check it out. It was on itch.io, and just search for Ghost in the Washing Machine or Washing Machine. However you like to say it. Um, I think it's worth the under 10 minute experience. If you're just kind of bored and you don't have anything else you feel like doing at the moment. I'm sure there are better things you could do with your time. Probably. It's not a game I'd imagine many people are itching to play. No pun intended. But. If you've been working at something, you've been doing your job, you've been doing what you need to do for a while, and you just need to turn your brain off for a few minutes and just enjoy some entertainment, but not too much. Just something to take a quick break, where some people might go outside and smoke. If you're not a smoker, go and play Ghost in the Washing Machine, and consider that your smoke break, and then get back to what you're doing. Don't go to play this game, complete it, and get stuck on it trying to best your high score. I think that that would be a little bit of a waste of time. Ultimately, I'm not the arbiter of how you spend your time, but there are, I mean, other games you can play too. Don't get stuck on this one. It's worth a playthrough once. A quick play, okay? And as far as a letter grade or a number grade score, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to get into the habit of grading things on that type of scale. I just want you to listen to my words and then you make your mind up as to whether or not it's something you want to go out and try. I'm not going to sit here and I'm going to say, oh, I did it last time. I did that last time. I don't want to get in the habit of it. I don't want people to say, oh, well, Super Divorce gave it a 8 out of 10. I got to try it out. We're not going to do that. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to explain to you some things about these games, but I'm not going to get into the, the number score game. That's not something I'm going to get involved with. All right, what's next? Moving on, last Wednesday, I played a game called Blood Wash. Two games dealing with washing machines in a row. Wouldn't have seen that coming. Never would have guessed that that would be something that would ever happen in the um, course of me playing video games, my video gaming career. I, I wouldn't have guessed at some point I would play two games basically uh, 
centered around washing machines. Though this game has a little bit more to it than that. Quite a bit more to it. But anyway, it's in the name and you do see them featured very prominently as you are going about your business in the game world. Okay. So Blood Wash released back on September 16th of 2021 by publisher Torture Star Video. Developed by Jordan King and Henry Hoer. I don't know exactly how you pronounce his name. H O A R E. Hoer. That's what I would imagine. It's Henry Hoer. Could be Hoar. Could be Hoare. I don't know. But I'll just say Henry. I'll call him Henry for now, since I don't know how you do his last name there. Uh, Henry, by the way, he helped out Scythe Dev Team on Happy's Humble Burger Barn. Played that game on this channel maybe a month or so ago. Uh, big fan of the Happy's Humble Burger Barn and Farm games. Uh, pretty much anything Scythe Dev Team has done has been awesome that I've played. Northbury Grove games, fantastic you haven't watched those videos if you never played them if you've never heard of them check out my gameplay videos here you can look up the uh northbury grove massacre arc it's four games and i crunched them all into one video i did individual playthroughs if you'd like to watch those individually you can but i also made a um a video that puts them all together a one-stop shop for your Northbury Grove games, and you can check that on uh, check that out on the channel as well, which I urge you to do, and then play them for yourself. Of course, that's ultimately what I would like everyone to do when it comes to me posting these gameplay videos: is to either help people out with uh, parts they're stuck in, or to spur people on to go and try these games out on their own. I don't want it to just be a replacement for actually playing the game. I understand that might be the case sometimes because you're dealing with PC games a lot of the time. Not everyone has a personal computer that they can use to play video games on. So for those people, I understand. But if you have a PC and you can play games on it, then I hope you're not just using the no commentary playthrough videos to watch the games instead of playing them. I don't think many people do that anyway. Uh, it's just not as fun. You want to have the experience for yourself. So, back to Jordan King and Henry Hoare. Henry. Um, Jordan has another game on the horizon called Night at the Gates of Hell, which looks to be another lo-fi horror title, same as Blood Wash. And... Um, He's also looking at releasing Booty Creek, Cheek Freak, Deathcade, and The Heebie Jeebies. All these games he wants to release in 2022, does Jordan. So if you'd like to follow Jordan on Twitter, keep up with his release schedule, look him up at Lego, L E G G O, my. Giallo, G-I-A-L-L-O, Lego My Giallo. That is, uh, again, Jordan King. Follow him, and uh, if you'd like to follow Henry, he is at Henry, H-O-A-R-E, number eight. Henry Hoare, eight, on Twitter. All right, so uh, let's talk about Blood Warsh, the experience of the game itself. You start off this game in your new apartment as a college girl named Sarah. Your boyfriend, Liam, he is hungover in the bathroom. And so when it's time to make a late night trip to the laundromat, Sarah must go it alone. Now, why does Sarah have to make a late night trip to the laundromat 
you might wonder. Sarah has a job interview in the morning, and her drunk boyfriend, the piece of shit, didn't do the laundry himself. So she comes home, no laundry done, she has nothing to wear for the morning for her job interview, and the apartment building washing machine, which you try to use first down in the creepy apartment basement, that's not working. That's down for maintenance. So Sarah has no other choice at this point than to take the bus out to the 24-7 laundromat on the edge of town. I mean, I guess she has another choice. That's to wear dirty clothes to the job interview, but she's not going to get the job if she wears dirty, smelly clothes to the job interview. So she's off to the 24-7 laundromat on the edge of town. She hops on the bus. Some creepy guy comes up. Some creepy bald-headed fellow with uh, with uh, some creepy like John Lennon-style uh, sunglasses. Those little roundy ones, you know. Comes up and tells her she's going to die tonight. And the child that she's carrying will also die tonight. Now, how this person knew that, Sarah is uh, pretty perplexed because I'm guessing Sarah's not showing at this point. So, you know, uh, that's a little that's a little strange. A strange prognostication from this stranger on the bus. Shortly after this interaction, Sarah is dropped off at the strip mall where you are going to go and do your laundry. So uh, take your clothes into the laundromat, toss your clothes into one of the washers there. Nice, big, spacious laundromat, by the way. Many machines to choose from. Washers and dryers, all various colors. It has a fantastic aesthetic to it and uh, very authentic for the sort of vibe and tone they're going for. I've been in laundromats like this in my life, so I knew exactly what the target was, the feeling, the vibe that, uh, you know, Jordan was trying to get across here, and he got it, went for it and got it, a slam dunk as far as atmosphere goes uh, in this game. And also the, you know, just the visuals in general. I can't say this enough, but I've become a huge sucker for these lo-fi sort of PS1 era looking horror games. I see top tier AAA titles with the newest graphics and the shit just, I don't, it's like, I don't want to be a hipster about it, but it's just boring to me at this juncture I'm just not very impressed by the most realistic graphics you've ever seen it's just not something that I'm blown away by anymore when I was coming up as a child in the well I started playing my first video games in the late 80s and go way back there uh, you know when when I had the uh, original NES playing Duck Hunt playing Mario Brothers, playing Gotcha. These are some of the games that I remember playing just over and over again. Um, Castlevania II, Simon's Quest, all the Super Mario Brothers games, Mega Man. You know, I was never really into Metroid when I was a kid. I loved Castlevania. I think I've talked about that before. I didn't own it, but I would rent it frequently from the local video stores. Way back then, it was Top Run or Take Two Video. Those were the local video stores in my neck of the woods. And then, you know, a little bit later, early 90s is when uh, Blockbuster first came to town. And then Hollywood Video and West Coast Video and Premier Video. So many fucking video stores back then. It was awesome. And now they're like all gone. We had a family video that was about 40 minutes away that I would actually drive to sometimes because I wanted my son to have the experience of walking around the video store 
and uh, renting shit and just because it was so much fun to do. I just loved it. Um, my wife and I used to go to the video store like every Friday when I was in high school and we were dating. And, you know, the first few years that that we lived together before Netflix was ubiquitous and everyone was doing their streaming shit. I mean, it's weird to have lived through that transition and uh, and just have it have that experience be something you can't really do anymore. It's just not available to you. Something that you used to do weekly. I mean, really, I would say that more weekends than not throughout my life up until video stores went away. I, I visited the video store like at least once a week. Probably more than that once, you know, I was able to drive myself there. Once I could start going to the video store. Because, you know, you'd beg your parents on the weekends. Oh, can we go rent a video? Can we go rent a game? Um, I, mean, I couldn't really walk to Blockbuster. It was a little too far from my house. But I could walk to Woody's, which was a nice grocery store in my town. A fantastic grocery store that has also gone now. Rest in peace. Fucking horse shit. Because, you know, you got Walmart. You got Meyer, You got the Super Duper Kroger. Woody's just couldn't keep up. But that place was awesome. Out in Dub C, West Carrollton, Ohio. We had Woody's. There was a restaurant on the uh, upper level. It was a two-story, um, a two-story uh, grocery store, and there was a restaurant upstairs that actually uh, stretched across, like you know, um, like a bridge. When you were eating your dinner, you could look out the window and you could see the cars passing underneath of you. That was always neat, and they had like a fountain and a little, you know, miniature little. Uh, well, kind of like a creek that went through the the restaurant. It looked very classy. I remember thinking it was like the fanciest place ever when I was a kid. Uh, had a had a bookstore on the upper level, fantastic bakery, um, and a video store. So I could walk to Woody's. We would walk to Woody's. I mean, starting when I was probably like in fourth grade. And it was still kind of a, a bit of a walk for a fourth grader. I think of my son making that walk now, and it you know, kind of makes me nervous. There's nowhere close by that, that he would go that, you know, he, nowhere within that distance. But still, um, it was awesome. I had a nice childhood. I feel bad for kids coming up now. Lack of adventures, lack of things to go out and do. Everything's situated online. It's all a bunch of horse shit. Anyway, back to Blood Warsh. I got off on that tangent just because I was talking about, uh, you know, the... I don't know, how the fuck did I get there? I don't know. I rambled a bit, didn't I? Well, that's going to happen from time to time. I'll try to keep track of things so I can get back to my point a bit, a, a, a bit more eloquently in the future. But... Sometimes one thing leads to another, and, and there you go, and Bob's your uncle. So, so Blood Warsh, another one of these PS1 style-ish games, and uh, they, they nailed that aesthetic, nailed the laundromat aesthetic. Everything looks great. The vibe and the feels, fantastic. So you go and put your clothes in the washer, and then you're free to explore a bit, which I took the liberty of doing. I always like to explore these locations when I go into a game. I'm not trying to make it through the game as quickly as possible. Some people have criticized me for that on gameplay videos, and I don't have anything for them. I've got this advice to offer. I say, look, if you came here trying to find a point A to point B speed run type walkthrough, you're barking up the wrong tree, pal. 
That's not what you're going to get from me. And that's not why I do this. I want to capture the experience of playing the game basically on a first attempt. Now, as I've gone on, I have started cutting out some horse shit. Uh, just because I don't think you need to see every single death. I've started doing that. I've tried trimming things up a little bit. I'll leave some deaths in, but I don't leave all of them. Uh, I, you know, I try to be easy on you. I don't want you to have to sit through me doing the same shit for two hours if I'm having trouble with something. So I'll trim it up a bit, but I want you to see what it's like going around, discovering, checking stuff out. I don't want to uh, have people watching my videos being like, man, why didn't he go explore that, that hallway? Or why couldn't he have stopped and and turned on the TV, uh, you know, why didn't he show us what was on the TV, stuff like that. I try to leave that in. I try to do all that because that's what I'm doing because I'm typically recording these things without ever having played the game before. So it is an authentic first playthrough experience. Anyhow, you get to go explore the laundromat and there are some kind of fun things to do. There's a TV that you can turn on, and uh, you can watch a few little programs that they have on the TV. Um, there's uh, one other guy in the place doing his laundry. You can go talk to him. There's the service attendant. When you first walk in, you can talk to that guy. Just go around, look at things, you know. Um, check out the magazine rack. As you're going through this game, there are some collectibles you can find, too. There's some uh, comic books you can pick up along the way. And you can read the comics. And I did. I read through a couple issues. Um, I can't remember what the name of the book was now. I should have made a note of that. Then there was uh, another book series that I couldn't find the issue one of, so I didn't, I didn't open the second issue because I wanted to find the first one before I cracked the second one open and I was never able to to find that one I don't know where it is I'm sure that I could find some other playthrough where a person has found it but I did not do that didn't take that step so please excuse me if that pisses you off well it kind of pissed me off that I couldn't find it to be honest with you so I, I share your pain Anyhow, when you leave the laundromat, you can actually explore the rest of the strip mall. And there are a few other little shops you can visit. There's Pea Paws, which was my favorite place in this game. Run by an old man, Pea Paw himself. And in this place, it's, um, it's like a combo store. They have a bunch of horror movies. And they also have like a big cereal aisle. Lots of cereal. They got video games, snacks. There's even a porno room. Like back in the old days, I remember my a couple of my local video stores, Top Run and Take Two. Those both had porno rooms. I remember seeing them and wondering, like, why I couldn't go back there. I was too young to really understand, but it was just I I would usually go with my grandpa, my peepaw. I didn't call him peepaw though. I called him pops. I'd go with my pops to the video store. He would take me whenever I wanted to go. Rent me whatever I wanted. I usually rented NES games and horror movies. Starting at a very, very young age. So, um, no surprise that I've, in adulthood, started a you know, YouTube channel where I'm basically doing nothing but playing old-fashioned horror movies video games that remind me of that time a little bit but you know that's when I discovered Freddy Krueger used to rent the same Freddy Krueger movies over and over there were some I would stay away from I would and it's funny because uh, you know I watched I watched Freddy I watched uh, I liked Pet Cemetery. though the gauge thing made me upset that was always really sad as a youngster. Um, I liked Alien. I liked Child's Play. But there were some videos just based on the box that I would stay away from. 
Like, I never wanted to watch Evil Dead. I remember seeing it, picking it up. I never wanted to watch Fright Night. That was another one I was, like, terrified of the box art when I'd be at the video store. I'd see it. Sometimes I'd pick it up and look at it, but I knew even when I was holding it, I'm like, I'm just looking at this to be scared right now. I'm not getting this. I'm not going to rent this movie. And I had this idea in my mind that Fright Night would have been like the the scariest movie I, I've ever seen in my life. And I never watched it until just a few years ago. And uh, I loved it. And I think I would have loved it as a kid too because it's it's not like a super scary horror movie. It's, it's kind of like a horror comedy in a way. Um, just kind of cheesy 80s horror. The same shit that I loved about Freddy. I would have loved uh, about Fright Night. You know, I love The Gate and Monster Squad. And it's more in line with those movies than some like really serious, dark and scary horror movie. But the cover of it is pretty frightening. They did a good job with that. Um, anyhow, in P. Paul's, they got that porno room. And like I said, when I was a kid, I used to see the porno room. It was blocked off. You know, it had the curtain. And I just knew from my grandpa telling you, you can't go in there. No, you can't. That's only for adults. You can't go back in that room. Okay, well, I don't really know what's going on back there, but uh, something strange, you know, I found out later on. Um, but you can actually visit the porno room in Peepaws and check out some of the videos, check out some of the posters, you know, some pinup stuff. Nothing too explicit, nothing I couldn't show on YouTube, but it's fun that they threw that in there, in Peepaws. You can talk to Peepaw, have a nice conversation with him, he seems like a pretty good guy. Um, run a nice store that that I would like to visit. I'd go to Peepaws, get some popcorn, walk around, look at videos and video games. Maybe pop into the porno room and see what they got going on. Um, down from Peepaws, a few stores. Not every store is open, mind you, in the strip mall. You can't go into every single location, but they have a few that are open. It is late at night, you have to understand, when you arrive. So Peepaws is open. The pizza parlor is open. You can go into the pizza parlor. You can't get yourself a slice. I think that would have been fun. If you could actually order a slice of pizza and have a little pizza pie slice when you're walking around. You can't do that. You can't get yourself a Coca-Cola. But you can play a game called Run Bums. Where you um, you control this bum. It took me a minute to figure out what you're supposed to do. But, uh, you know, it's like a kind of like a vertical runner where, um, you know, you're a bum running down the street you can't stop but you can move left and right and uh, you have to throw up at the obstacles in front of you there are pigs dressed as police officers you throw up on them and get them out of the way and then there are some snakes I think with top hats you have to dodge I didn't make it very far there's an achievement I think if you score 5,000 or more points, which I did not do. I think I could have done it if I tried it a few times, but I only, I think I only played it twice and then got out of the pizza parlor. Uh, there's also a handheld game that you can, you can play. You can find the handheld game in the lost and found bucket. Um, it's not a bucket. It's like a, what would you call that? Tray. There's a lost and found tray when you first walk into the laundromat at the front counter and you can pick up a handheld video game device and you can play um, handheld game there and uh, you know try and get the high score on that there's an achievement for that one too which I did get so uh, lots of fun little little doodads and snickerty doos that you can play when you're going through blood wash not engaging in the main storyline, but just kind of fucking around on the side. Just playing the game. Casually as heck. 
Now there's also an appliance store that you can go into. Not much of note in there, just a bunch of old appliances. You can talk to the guy who runs the place. My least favorite location. Not a whole lot happening there. Nothing much. So um, after visiting all the local shop owners and doing some searching around, you learn that there has been a string of disappearances in town. Seems to be pregnant women, of which you are one. Pregnant women are going MIA. No one knows what's happening to them in this area. Peepaw tells you a little bit about that. He actually sent his, uh, his family away from this area because of uh, all of the abductions, seeming abductions, I guess. So you can't confirm because people are just missing. They don't know where they're heading off to. They don't know what's happening to them. So uh, do your wandering around, do your talking to people, finish your laundry, and it's still wet. Unacceptable. So you go look for the laundromat worker, the clerk, who you first talk to when you walk in, and you find him in his office dead. Dead as a doornail. Call the cops. And then, um, then you transfer the play over to a, a different character. You take control of a different character. You take control of Officer Burton 20 minutes in the future. And you pull up to the plaza, head inside the tax building, which now has the light on. You can get in the tax building. Previously, when you're playing as Sarah, you could not. But when you come in as Officer Burton... You can enter the tax building where you hear a strange kind of baby crying sound. Though something seems off about it. doesn't sound exactly like a baby. It's like baby crying-ish. There's something weird about it. Maybe a bit deeper tone. You go into the tax building. You look around for a bit. Spoiler, you get killed by the womb ripper which is the name of the villain in this story. The Womb Ripper, targeting pregnant women. And uh, the Womb Ripper comes out and gets you. You think you're doing well. You go through the tax building. Um, you find one other person in there. You see them get torn up by the Womb Ripper. You make your daring escape, you go through the vents, you're crawling through the vents, and then all of a sudden the womb ripper pops up in front of you, and uh, before you have time to react, you're slaughtered. You're taken away, you're taken care of, and play goes back to Sarah. Take back over to Sarah, the front door of the blood wash laundromat is locked. You can't get out, so you're going to have to find a different way to exit this building and um, what you do is you find a hammer and if you do a little snooping around you'll notice that one of the walls down the hallway by the change machine at the far end of the building one of this one of these walls has been repaired and uh, it looks a little shoddy so you take your hammer to it you rip through and you end up in the old laundromat location which was right next door there was a fire there um someone appeared to die in the fire a lady was locked inside the building uh it was set on fire maliciously and um when they uh, went in to investigate they couldn't find the body they figured it all burned up you know, in the conflagration. And uh, so you, you enter this uh, old burned down laundromat location, which they never renovated, didn't bother to fix up. They just left it like it was, burned down in ruins. Some washing machines and, and washing machine parts and such still strewn about. And then they uh, they just moved right next door. You know, they didn't even bother to leave the strip mall. And they said, you know what? No big deal. We just had this fire that was set here. We think someone died. 
we're not going to fix up this location that we had been running for years. No, we're just going to move it right next door. Just take everything one spot over to the right and we'll set up shop there. And that's what they did. So uh, you go in, you know, you're snooping around, you find some dead bodies, tension builds, you know the womb ripper is somewhere nearby. You find Officer Burton's pistol because apparently the womb ripper dragged him in there. I think you just find his arm and his pistol. It doesn't say that it's Officer Burton's, but we can deduce that uh, it is his because you just were playing as him. You got attacked by the womb ripper and then take back over as Sarah. You find an arm with a pistol. That's got to be Officer Burton's. So you pick up the pistol and then... You know, you, you have to uh, you have to confront the womb ripper eventually in the ruins of this uh, old abandoned laundromat. Take out the womb, womb ripper. It's kind of tough to say if you keep doing it. Um, and save the day and save yourself and your baby. And prove that stranger on the bus wrong. Prove him wrong that you're not going to die tonight. Your baby's not going to die tonight. You're going to take fate into your own hands and save the day maybe save the town save some future victims uh, now the big reveal of the game is who the womb ripper actually was and who that man on the bus was it wasn't a man at all the womb ripper was actually a lady named Samantha a pregnant lady who was locked in the laundromat by a guy named Lewis. And uh, Lewis attempted to burn down the laundromat with Samantha inside. She escaped, but only after her baby perished in the fire. So the baby did not make it. She did. And that caused her to go nuts. She apparently shaved her head. And began bandying about town, dressed like this strange man that encounters you on the bus. That's how the strange man knew you were going to die tonight. Because that was actually Samantha the Womb Ripper marking you as her next victim. So how about that? So you take out Samantha the Womb Ripper. And that seems to be the end of the game. But it's not. There's an extra little bonus section where you take over as a third player. The third character you play as in this game is the, um, what do you call him? The, uh, the morgue worker. The morti is it a mortician? The coroner, that's it. Mortician works at the fucking, what do you call it? The funeral home usually is where the mortician would be found but no you play as the coroner you go into your your room there to do your work and you see that the womb ripper is there on the slab about to do the autopsy and you're all excited because you're like oh i can't believe i'm actually i'm actually going to do the autopsy on the the womb ripper and uh long story short the womb ripper is not dead and ends up getting off that slab and putting the coroner in, uh, uh, you know, in a, an unfortunate position. Uh, there on his own table, we could probably surmise. And that's about that on Blood Warsh. So that was quite the game quite something I had a good time playing that one uh, it was a longer more in-depth and uh, just more fleshed out experience than I was expecting it to be I thought without knowing you know how long it was I was expecting it to maybe be a another 15 to 20 minute experience a short little 
a short horror game, a short horror story type game, but multiple locations, multiple characters to play as, a, a surprise twist ending, collectibles to be found, people to interact with, you know, things to do, mini games, just great. Just an awesome little indie horror game. So I would I would love to see everyone out there try uh, Blood Wars for themselves. Check that out. All right. So we can move on to Thursday's game. Janitor Bleeds. Found this one on Steam. Been finding a lot more on itch.io than than on Steam lately, but I, I finally found a new Steam game that looked, you know, like it was worthy of playing. Published by Bonus Stage Publishing. Developed by Corpus, with a K. K-O-R-P-U-S. They also did um, a demo of this game on the Haunted PS1 demo disc. There was a demo version of Janitor Bleeds that some people might have already been familiar with. I was not because I didn't uh, I didn't play any of the uh, PS1 de- demo disc games. I didn't really get into this scene until fairly recently. I would say with all the Scythe dev team stuff, that's really where I, I began dipping my toe into this entire world of alt indie horror games because so many of these games never make it to steam or the the creators just don't care to put them on there um so until you find out about a website like itch.io or you find out about some of these creators by following one on twitter and then you see them retweeting other people's games who are kind of in that same community it's it's a really niche thing it's a niche community or niche, whatever you prefer. And uh, more people should know about it because there's a lot of really quality games out there to play that offer you a fun experience, stuff you can get through in like one sitting for five to ten bucks that's genuinely fun that you can tell has heart and people cared to make something on their own that others could enjoy. It's not just... Uh, uh, a reskin of last year's game the way you get with a lot of these triple a titles so um it's a it's a cool little thing to have stumbled on anyway janitor bleeds um let's see here this is also kind of ps1 style <clears throat> maybe not as rough around the edges looking as blood wash Bloodwash kind of has that uh, not only PS1 style graphics, but also like, a, you know, a bit of a VHS filter over top of it. So Janitor Bleeds was a little bit cleaner, a little more polished looking. Maybe mid-90s PC game-ish. And um, in this one, you crash your car in the woods, stumble upon an abandoned arcade called uh, Hemos, Hemos Arcade, Hemos. You investigate the arcade, and first thing I did was just kind of walk around. I looked at all the arcade cabinets. I was searching high and low for these little tokens because I figured I'm going to have to play some of these games. So I'm going to, as soon as I found one token, I knew there have to be more. So I, I started looking around. I spent a good deal of time when I first entered the arcade doing nothing but searching high and low for all the tokens I could find. Turns out you can only carry 10 at a time in case you play this yourself and you start searching up and down looking for all these tokens. Uh, You can carry 10. That's your max. But remember where if you, you know, if you have a pocket full of tokens and you stumble upon some other ones, keep in mind where they are because you will need to use them probably. Uh, anytime you are prompted to play the titular 
janitor game, which is the only game that you end up playing. It's called janitor. Um, you have to play it multiple times throughout the game. And each time you play it, you have to use three tokens to fire the game up. So keep that in mind. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of cool looking cabinets, pinball machines, uh, but you know what? Even after you turn the power on, none of the cabinets work. I thought that was disappointing because I thought, okay, I'm entering this old school arcade. I'll flip the power on and I'll mess around some with, you know, hopefully some of these games that I'll be able to play, but you can't. It gave me a similar feeling as to when you're playing Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach and you go in like the Fazbear Arcade and there's all these cool arcade machines but you can't play any of them. And that's disappointing to me. Even if it's like a really simple almost phoned in experience I'd like for the arcade cabinets to be interactive. Even if it's like a clone of Pac-Man or a clone of Galaga or something like that. Or you know even something more simplistic, a, a clone of Pong, whatever. It would be nice if you're in a game like this, power's on, the machines actually start up and you can go around and play them. But you don't get the opportunity to do that. Uh, you can only play the janitor game, which you need to do. That's part of the mechanics of this game and how it works. Um, you actually have to play the janitor game to proceed through the story. And the way that works is basically you take control of the janitor in the game that looks like an Atari game, looks like Atari era. You're, you're moving around the screen as the uh, janitor. You have the mop. You clean up spills and you clean up piles of trash. It would be like a garbage can. And what you do is you walk over to the garbage can in the game, in the janitor arcade game, and when you clean the trash up, it will remove an obstacle from inside the arcade that you're walking around in. So it's like the janitor game you're playing has an effect on the real world you're walking around in, in janitor bleeds. So you have to do that, and you have to find different janitor machines that will kind of be at different levels, you know. You start a new uh, a new game on a new machine. You find the obstacle in the game, clear it out, new path opens, and you can continue through the arcade and uh, continue making your way through the story. So that's that's kind of how that works. That's how that mechanic, um, you know, unfolds throughout the game. So. Uh, you got to uh, you got to do that. You got to clean up the trash. You have to find some keys in the janitor game, and then the key comes out of the arcade cabinet somehow. It'll like float in front of you when you find it in the game. So you have to transfer the keys you find in the janitor arcade game out of the arcade game. Grab hold of it. Walk around. Unlock doors. You know. Pretty standard fare, shit like that. It is, it's kind of neat, though, the idea that you can transfer these items not just out of the janitor game, but in, uh, you know, in, in some uh, circumstances, you'll have to actually put something into the game. You have to transfer your flashlight, for instance, into the game for the janitor that you're controlling to use on a particular part. Stuff like that. So um, it's a, it's got a little bit of a puzzle-ish element to it. Some brain teasers make you think about what you got to do to proceed. And all the while, there's a mysterious kind of glitchy looking entity that wanders the arcade. It's not always coming after you, but you'll hit certain parts where you have to avoid this entity and um, until you make it past that section it's going to be coming after you're going to have to avoid it there's no way to kill it so it's like stay out of the line of sight don't uh don't alert it 
anyway and you know move on to the next at the very end you have to kill the entity using a couple of light guns that you find you know like the uh, the guns you would have used to play what's it called time crisis if you ever played the time crisis arcade game it's like those light guns you find a pair of light guns and then you enter into this room that's uh, you know trapped you in with the entity and a bunch of bloody looking arcade cabinets and you have to uh, shoot him up until he's dead and the first time I did that there was a bug in the game that I did not know about that got patched like while I was playing it so I mean it didn't the patch was released let me say it that way the patch was released while I was playing it so I had to quit the game and then when I went back to uh, to fire it up again the patch downloaded and I was able to start it and actually complete that boss fight but the first time I faced the entity I had to have run around this damn arcade for like 20 minutes shooting it with these light guns and there was no indication that any of the um, that any of like you know my attempts to hit it were actually connecting there was no health meter there was no like flashes of light to show that it was making contact that was actually doing any damage and I just assumed that that was how they made it you know because everything else had worked fine up to that point I hadn't run into any glitches or anything but it was really pissing me off because I was like why would you put this bullet sponge boss fight at the end of this game that's been pretty straightforward not much bullshit and then you throw a bullet sponge boss fight at the very end with no health meter with no animation to let the player know that they're actually making contact with it I was really getting bothered and I finally just decided to let it kill me and I was going to be done with it it was going to be filed under can't deal with it which is what I do when I reach a, a point in a game that's too bullshit for me to bother with anymore not because it's, it's too difficult but see in that case it's like I was staying alive it's not like I reached a point in the game that was just too hard my skill was being tested it was too bullshit and that's what I would consider bullshit if they actually would have done that and that would have been their programming then I would have penalized them and said can't deal with it I'm not finishing your fucking game and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna let people know that I'm not gonna tell them not to play it I'm just gonna say I didn't finish it and here's why if this sounds like fun to you then you go try it but luckily it was a mistake and I saw that that was part of the fix it was like fixed entity boss fight okay all right well fire it back up here and I'll give it another shot and it's not difficult at all to get through um, drop down into that little arcade room the entity comes after you blast it with a light gun it's you know a couple minutes it's not like it, it had a an infinite health bar the way that I had imagined the first time I was playing you know it was a pretty quick and easy boss fight all things considered so you get past that part and um, and then there's still another sort of Lovecraftian kind of cosmic monster that you have to face at the very end and um, it's got I guess you might call them eyeballs it looks like a you ever seen Day of the Tentacle that's what this thing reminded me of like a big kind of a big blobby kind of cosmic cone entity with some noodly appendages and eyeballs everywhere these like yellow eyeballs they could have been yellow pustules I don't know but you have to shoot those with a light gun until you popped all of them and then um, and then that's it and then the facade we could call it of the arcade that you've been running around in disappears the monster disappears 
and you're standing sort of in the ruins of this arcade that you think you've been walking around in, but have you? Were you in a different dimension? Did any of that actually happen, or were you just kind of imagining it? That's the story of that one. You don't really know. Was it real? Was it not? Kind of up in the air. So, yeah, that's Janitor Bleeds. And uh, my thinking on that one was that after having just played Blood Warsh, it just it wasn't on that level of depth or design. It was all right. It was all right. I think I expected a bit more looking at the screenshots, looking at the atmosphere being inside this arcade. It just wasn't as it wasn't as varied, you know. Um once you get into it, <clears throat> you're kind of seeing the same machines over and over again. None of them work, which was, again, disappointing, in my opinion. And uh, really didn't have, like, a memorable soundtrack or anything, which can kind of hurt a game like that. So, it was all right. It wasn't horrible, <clears throat> but I wouldn't say it was fantastic either. So, that's, uh, that's Janitor Bleeds. If you want to follow the creators of Janitor Bleeds, the publishers, Bonus Stage Publishing. You can find them on Twitter at Bonus Stage Pub. If you'd like to follow the developer, Corpus, they're on Twitter at Corpus with a K, K-O-R-P-U-S, official. At Corpus Official. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, salting my notes for what's next. What else did I play last week? On Friday, played a game called Amanda the Adventurer. Found this one on Itch from developer James Pratt, an Ontario man who can be followed on Twitter at JP Game Design. No, 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 sorry. Uh, Twitter is, I looked up his Twitter and it was gone. But you can follow his exploits in his career at jpgamedesign.com. James Pratt, a man of Ontario, Canada, also created some uh, other games here. Uh, one called TV Time, created Crab Cake Collection, Super Happy Penguin Pals, Appealing Personality, that's A P. E-E-L-I-N-G, appealing, like you peel something. It is a speed dating sim slash banana eating contest. So you might want to look into that. Dark Roads, visual novel, Croc Creek, and a game called Speakeasy. So he's got a few things under his belt. Does James Pratt. Here's some trivia for you. You know what James Pratt's favorite video game ever is? I got this from his website. Banjo-Tooie. Not Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo-Tooie. You don't hear people bring up Banjo-Tooie very often. But he is a big horror fan. And that, I guess, informed his decision to create this game, Amanda the Adventurer. In this game, and I have trouble calling it a game because there is very, very little interactivity in this one. But uh, it is a cool experience, I could say. You find three VHS tapes on a table in front of you, and you just watch them. And there are like a couple times that you get prompted to do some typing on your keyboard, Mostly you're just watching these little, uh, you know, animated segments of, Adman of Amanda the Adventurer. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a, kind of like a parody, I suppose, of Dora the Explorer. Dora the Explorer. Amanda the Adventurer. You've got a little lamb friend with you 
and each tape puts you in a different scenario. Um, you know, imagine these as like little mini episodes of a kid's show is kind of how it plays out. And they might ask you, you know, um, to spell something and that's where you do your typing. But there's not like, there's nothing as far as taking control of a character and walking around any sort of location. It's mostly just you watching the videos and nothing super creepy happens until really like the final moments of tape number three where the titular Amanda seems to become angry with you and her eyes turn white and like roll back in her head and the tape glitches and then her neck like snaps and kind of rolls around you know and uh and then it's the end so it was a very quick experience but it has potential and it's resonated with people because the upload of that one is i mean as far as views go it's my most viewed video from last week it's got like 5000 views on it and that really surprised me because uh, i mean once i played it i was going to post it but i figured it would be a one of those things i throw up and it gets like 10 views just because there was so little to it and so little interactivity it's not like you were watching me do much as far as playthrough goes just click on a tape watch it go into the old combo vhs slash tv but for some reason people are really digging it and i hope that uh james pratt is aware of that i hope that james pratt's kind of following along and seeing that he's getting a big reaction a lot of people are watching this lots of people are commenting and if i were him i would get on top of it putting together you could con uh, kind of consider this like a partially playable teaser but it would be neat if he does something with this world and these cast of characters that he's come up with that allows the person playing to have a little bit more input, a little bit more to do. Maybe actually create an environment where you can walk around as Amanda or walk around as the, her little lammy sheep friend and do some tasks and come up with some different, um, you know, different shit. So... I wish James Pratt the best with it. I'm glad he created it. It's helping my channel grow. So thanks for that, brother. And if you liked Amanda the Adventurer, leave a comment. Leave a comment with ideas of what James Pratt could do for a follow-up. To expand upon this Amanda the Adventurer storyline and universe, if you will. That's Amanda the Adventurer. Check that out on itch.io or you can just watch my playthrough. This is one of those rare occasions where I would say you could probably just watch my video instead of playing it for yourself. I mean, I'm fairly certain it uh, I'm fairly certain it's either free or name your own price. So I don't think James would be mad if you did that, if you just watched mine. It's so quick. It's like by the time you navigate over to itch.io, download it, extract it, and start it up, you probably could have finished my video and just checked it out, you know, that way. But maybe you want to help him out anyway and just give him the encouragement so he sees more people are downloading it. It's a toss-up. Whatever you want to do, guys. All right, so um, I didn't play anything on Saturday. I had too much going on. There's a lot of stuff happening Saturday. I wanted to get this podcast done on Saturday. That was the plan. My new release schedule was going to be to do an episode on Monday and then an episode on Saturday every week. Monday was going to be kind of just shooting the shit, talking about games that I might know 
were coming out looking forward to playing throughout the week and then Saturday would be like the review day of going through all the games and and giving you my breakdown and my thoughts and commentaries and all that and I think the way it's working out is we're just going to stick with a Monday podcast because Saturday turns out is not a good day for me to try to record I've got the kids and uh, I basically have to count on all the kids like doing a good nap time not interrupting and uh, giving me the time to sit and get this done which is just not happening right now which doesn't really happen I also have to go out on Saturdays to the local milk farm We drive once a week to get our milk, our farm fresh milk from our herd share. You have to own like part of the cow to do that where I live because our our state representatives, the people running the show, they have decided that, uh, you know, fresh milk is contraband. It's contraband. You can't buy it. You can't just go and buy farm fresh milk from a farmer you can't do that it's not allowed literally they call it contraband the way around that however that people have come up with is something called a herd share so instead of selling you the milk they sell you part ownership of a cow and since it's partially yours you are allowed to get the milk and drink it and that's that's sort of the loophole so we get uh, farm fresh milk that way and we get um, cheeses and uh, and honey and eggs and all sorts of other good shit that you don't have to go and, and buy at the at the supermarket you support your local farm farmers you know all that good stuff So anyway, I have to do that on Saturdays. And that's another reason why it's not a good day for me to record a podcast. Because that trip is about 40 minutes there, 40 minutes back. You know, I got the kids running around. It's just, uh, it's just not a good day for, for trying to record an episode. So I didn't. I tried to find a game to do and, um... I started one. It's the next game I'm going to talk about. Babysitter Bloodbath. I tried it out on Saturday. And I was going to try to get it uploaded. And uh, I was having some trouble with it. It was giving me fits. Not an easy game. Ended up playing it again yesterday. Sat down. Pushed through. And got it done. Got the upload onto the channel. Babysitter Bloodbath from Pig Farmer Games. Up until 2016, uh, Pig Pig Farmer Games, um, or sorry, in 2016, Pig Farmer Games became Puppet Combo. So um, you can follow Puppet Combo on Twitter at Puppet Combo. Puppet Combo. Good, uh, good people. PC, as I like to call them, they actually retweeted my playthrough of Bloodwash, and the creator of Bloodwash, one of them, Jordan King, he went on that tweet and he thanked me for playing. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, but anyway, back to Puppet Combo, the creators of Babysitter Bloodbath, they have a fantastic Patreon. Just great. You should check it out. Their one dollar tier gets you exclusive updates videos picks and discord benefits i got a five dollar tier that gets you access to all of the current year games that puppet combo has released and then also access to a monthly new game or prototype or experiment and then early access forums and special thanks in their credits and then at the ten dollar level You get uh, download keys for their next Steam game and access to the entire Puppet Combo library. 
Now, I went ahead and did that one because though it was bullshit in some parts, though I was pretty pissed off, once I made it through and I had the experience, I got the game completed, I wanted to uh, check out more of their stuff. And so when I was browsing the Patreon, I saw what you get at that $10 level, access to the entire Puppet Combo library. That is over 71 uh, downloads, 71 different items, or more than 71 different items that you can look at, but I believe it's 71 in the download section on Patreon. Once you've subscribed at the $10 level, there are 71 different downloads for you. Now, some of them are different versions of the same game that they've released, you know, like Hey, here's an early build of this game, and then they release the uh, the next build of it on the uh, Patreon feed for all their patrons. But a lot is just a new game, a different entry in their catalog for you to try, for you to play the full thing. So that is well worth it. If you're considering signing up for a new Patreon, go and check out Puppet Combos. You will not be disappointed. And then there's also another tier above that, the $25 level. Every new game that they put out on CD-ROM, you will get automatically at least one week before it goes on sale on their website. So that's that's pretty dang cool. Um yeah and their website the puppet combo store has some of the games they put out on cd-rom previously that you can still pick up i think a couple might be sold out now but if you're a collector i thought that was a neat little item you could grab kind of in ps1 style packaging has that kind of look to it so they are right in the pocket on the classic horror stuff, those puppet combo people. So what is Babysitter Bloodbath all about? I said I almost threw the towel in on this one um, because it was so difficult at certain parts. But I gutted it out. I made it happen. And, uh, you know... Part of the reason I didn't want to give up and throw in the towel is because it kind of would have been my fault. And I don't, I, I try not to file a game as can't deal with it unless it's something that I can pin on the creator, not just on my lack of skill or ability. So after I, after I put a few hours in, took a step away, took a nice break came back to it. I was like, all right, I can do this. I'm going to do this now. Um, I, I kind of came back to it with a renewed sense of vigor and resolve and just powered through. And there were some disappointing moments. There were, there were some, uh, some gnashing of teeth. But I'm here now, and I can tell you about my experience with this game. So... In this babysitter bloodbath, uh, you you are playing the role of a babysitter named Sarah. It's a cold autumn night in Monroe, Washington. And you are tasked with watching little Billy Johnson. While his mommy and daddy are going to go out for the evening, you, Sarah, you're going to stay home with Billy. Hold down the fort. Uh, now, before... I go too much further into this. When you start the game, you can play in either VHS mode, which has that kind of VHS filter on it, or you can play in DVD mode, which gives you crystal clear visuals. I played in VHS mode. Uh, you also get some camera options. You can play in first person, third person, over the shoulder kind of deal, or in movie mode 
which is like classic survival horror, fixed camera, original Resident Evil, Silent Hill, that type of deal. And that's what I did for the classic appeal. If I would have played in first or third person, I think the game would have been much easier. But the tank controls in this game with the layout of the house, with kind of the way that the character moves, um, it's a little trying. It definitely takes a minute to get used to. And the camera angles do not necessarily help you as far as remembering the way the house is laid out. It's like it tricks you on purpose almost. So uh, that was another hurdle that I had to jump in order to get myself to a point where I could competently make it through this game. I thought about, after I quit on Saturday, like right before I started it up on Sunday, I was really thinking about moving into first or third person mode. Because I was like, is is the fixed camera mode, is movie mode just too tough? And the answer is no. It's not too tough. It's just that I was being a pussy and I had to stop being a pussy and get my shit together and figure out a way to get the job done, which I, I did. Okay? So, um, anyway. The parents of little Billy, Linda and Mark Johnson have a little conversation with them before they head out for the night and you get a couple different prompts where you can ask a question you have to choose between two options you get like you know question a or question b to ask to the parents before they go and uh, you can ask for the number where they're going they'll give that to you you can call it it doesn't really do anything uh, when i tried calling it I think a, a person answers on the other line, you know, it's, um, I'm, I think a restaurant and you ask for the, uh, couple Johnson, they're not there yet. So you don't get to talk to them. And then later on the phone doesn't work. So there was nothing of consequence that happened from calling that number. As far as I could tell, um, and then what else? Uh, they tell you that their second car in the garage is out of gas. So if you need anything, you're going to have to wait until they get home. So if you try to leave the house, you'll get this little message that comes up. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm stuck here. There's no car to use. I got to wait until they get back. You know, that kind of, that kind of shit. And again, right off the bat, those tank controls, when you take over, they're not real tight. They're not like Resident Evil or Silent Hill kind of tight tank controls. It almost feels like you're on ice a little bit. And that's a little slippery. So that added to the difficulty just a bit, especially in the more intense moments of the game. When you're trying to maneuver just so and your character gets caught like on the tippy edge of a door or something like that because the collision detection is uh, a little brutal in this one there's one particular moment at the near the end of the game when i was uh you know i was trying to run away from the killer through the upstairs and it just kept happening there's like one door in one of the rooms that I kept getting stuck on, it was really, really pissing me off. But, you know, you just have to adapt. It's like, all right, I have to make sure that I am steering quite clear of that door when I'm running past it. I cannot continue to get caught on that door or else I am going to perish. I'm going to die in a very bloody and gruesome way. And I didn't want that to happen. So... What do you do when you start the game? When you take control, once you get control and you kind of get the tank controls going, figuring out how to move, explore the house a little bit. That's what I did first thing. In the dining room, there's a, a radio that you can turn on and you hear a news report talking about an escaped mental patient, a psychopath who's out and about and considered very dangerous. Obviously, that's the 
man who's coming after you. So um, back in the living room, go to turn on the TV and find that you need a remote control to do that. Search the house, find it's up in little Billy Johnson's bedroom on the floor. What the fuck was he doing with it there? That's a pet peeve of mine. You go to turn the TV on, channel changer's gone. Why? Why? The channel changer should not leave the general area of the TV. You can put it on the side table. You can put it on the TV stand. You could maybe even put it on the the mantle in the fireplace. But no one should ever find the remote control for the TV in the kitchen, in the dining room, in one of the kids' bedrooms, in the office. Never. It should not happen. So the fact that the remote control was on the floor in Billy's bedroom... It's just not a place you would you would think to look. Why would that little shit take the controller, the, the remote control up to his bedroom and then just leave it on the floor? Seems like a lack of discipline going on in that house. The boy needs a talking to. So uh, you get that, you know, you get the damn thing for the TV, you know, and uh, what else do you find around the house? You find some VHS tapes as you're going about. You would use those to save the game in Resident Evil they had ink ribbons in this game in Babysitter Bloodbath they have VHS tapes so when you find a VHS tape make sure you pick it up there are very few I only found three that means you can save three times in this game so you best make them count um, you find a flashlight in one of the bedrooms upstairs you're going to need that for show and uh, so you get the TV going for Billy and then you get a phone call you get a phony phone call from Ed Rooney and it's the psycho and he's mumbling and grumbling and saying all sorts of weird ass shit in a creepy creepy tone muffly voice you hang up Phone rings again, immediately, and you think it's him again, but it's not. It's your friend Jill, and actually you think that she's the one who made the obscene phone call, but it wasn't her. It was the psycho. Your friend Jill asks you, you know, what you're up to for the night, and if you're going to call the guy from the mall. You met a handsome fellow at the mall named Jack, and uh, yes, you are going to call him, but first you have to go get his phone number from your coat which Mr. Johnson took for you when you first walked in. So you head over to the coat uh, rack in the coat closet. You're looking for it. And little Billy Johnson appears behind you, snickering, shit-eating grin on his face. And he says, hey, hey, you looking for this? You know, he's got Jack's phone number. So he starts running all over the house. And you have to try to catch him. Now, I found the best thing to do was just to go into the living room and stand in front of one of the doors and start mashing the space bar, which is kind of your action button to stop and uh, you know talk to someone or to examine items, what have you. Just stand in front of a door and just start spamming that space bar. And eventually, he'll probably run into you and you can get your, um, you know, you can get your uh, boyfriend's phone number there. So you take the phone number, go back to the phone, call up Jack, and he wants to come over for some alcohol and and some sex. You know, that's what you guys are going to get up to. Uh, but you got to find the alcohol first, and then you're going to call him back. So, track down Billy again. You ask him if, uh, you know, he knows where the key to your parents' liquor, or the, uh, his parents' liquor cabinet is. And he knows, but first, 
He wants you to make him something to eat. He needs a little snackety snack. The snackety snack can be found in the kitchen. It's a box of cereal. And in the refrigerator, you can find some milk. Go into your menu, combine the items, and then take little Billy his bowl of cereal. And he gives you the liquor cabinet key. A little trade there. Yeah. So you head upstairs, get the liquor from the liquor cabinet, call Jack, walk back into the living room. You see that Billy's passed out on the floor and he has spilt his cereal everywhere. He's passed out. He's cereal drunk. His bowl's been overturned. There's a big milk mess on the ground. You don't have to clean that up or anything. Would have been a good job for the janitor from uh, Janitor Bleeds, but you don't have to do that. So you just carry Billy upstairs, you put him to bed, and then ding dong, bing bong, uh, someone's ringing the doorbell. Do you unlock the door? Yes, you're going to have to. You unlock the door, you go outside, and Jack scares you. You know, I knew at this point that it wasn't going to be the killer this early. I knew it was going to be a false, a false scare, just a jump scare, just something fun. You know, he comes out uh, with a mask on, takes it off, and it's it's boyfriend Jack from the mall. You go inside, sit down on the couch, start watching a scary movie. It's Night of the Living Dead, and uh, then there's a crash in the backyard. As you're going to retrieve some beer for you and Jack, you hear a crash in the backyard. You go back in the living room. You're like, Jack, yo, you got to go and check out the sound. Uh, something's out there. He's like, well, I don't want to check it out. I, I want to watch the scary movie. And No, come on, Jack. You got to do it. You got to help. I'm scared. I don't know what it is. You got to go and look. He's like, what do you want me to do? What am I going to do if there's someone out there? And Sarah says, you're going to beat him up. That's what you do. You're the boyfriend. You got to go out there and you got to man up. You got to you got to put them in their place if there's someone snooping and sneaking around. So, you know, you uh you kind of push him, question his manhood, send him out into the backyard and several seconds later you hear him scream. Blood-curdling scream from the backyard and the lights go out in the house. And all that's left to do is to go out back and investigate. Because if you go to the phone, you find there's no dial tone. And you can't leave the house because you can't drive anywhere. So, you go out back to look around. Hopefully, he's just messing around with you. He's not. He's not. uh, You're going to want to pick up the axe in front of you. When you step out into the yard, there's an axe um, that has been... uh, positioned on a tree trunk you grab that follow the left side of the fence straight to the back of the yard and you will stumble upon Jack's lifeless body that has been pinned up to the fence with a screwdriver the psycho stabbed Jack right through the sternum with a screwdriver awful hard enough to just peg him right into the damn fence where he's hanging there now before you turn around and run you want to grab that screwdriver because you're going to need it for something so you grab the screwdriver and then that pretty much initiates the killer coming after you and you uh, you need to make it back to the back porch and start pounding on the door because it's locked and uh, you got to pound on the door. You got to use your space bar. You got to spam, spam, spam it. I died here several times. And that was really, really pissing me off. That was a point of contention for me. I couldn't understand what I was doing wrong. Turns out, like, you know, you, you start spamming that space bar pound, 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 pound. And then you stop 
banging on the door. And I thought that that's when Billy was going to come and rescue you and open the door for you. But that doesn't happen. You have to keep banging on that space bar even after you stop pounding and then you start pounding again. So there's like a break in the action. You just have to like pound away through it on your keyboard. Don't be fooled. When Sarah stops, don't be fooled. Keep going. And eventually, as long as uh, the killer doesn't get to you, Billy will open the door and then you have to run inside. It's not like the door opens and then a cutscene starts, mind you. The door opens and you have to actually press forward to run inside the house. So you get in and you tell Billy he needs to go and hide, you know. And um, when he goes to hide, you're going to want to go upstairs. However, I found this out. At the top of the stairs, when you get up there, you don't want to turn immediately right and start walking kind of down the upstairs hallway. If you do that, you end up passing by the upstairs bathroom, the door busts open, and the killer comes out, and he will stab you to death. Unless you can run away from him. But it's better to just avoid that entire scene, man, if you can. When you get upstairs, turn right, a slight right, you know, not a hook right all the way to the right where you go through the hallway, but turn right into Billy's room and then go through Billy's closet, which connects to the next room. You walk out that door and then when you go back in the hallway, uh, you can head over to the laundry chute, which you can open up with the screwdriver that you just took out of your dead boyfriend's body and uh, then you hop down the laundry chute easy easy peasy um, now down the basement this can be a real son of a bitch part what you have to do in the basement is make your way around a kind of confusing labyrinthian layout to find revolver ammo a key for the upstairs bedroom and a VHS tape. You're going to want that one. And you also need to find some bolt cutters. I can't explain to you exactly how to get to these rooms. Uh, you can watch the video if you want help with that. But like I said, it's kind of labyrinthian. It really messes with your mind. It took me several times to do this because um, you never know where the guy is going to be hiding. It seems random. It's like randomly generated. So you might get a good run where he just doesn't pop up for a while. But then you might also get a run where he's like appearing behind you everywhere you go. And that can be very frustrating. And that can make you want to throw the game away and just quit. But don't do that. You'll get it. Hang in there. Uh, so... After you have all those items, what I suggest is you use your last save right there. And then head upstairs. Use the key. Use the bedroom key for the upstairs from the closet in the locked bedroom. You will retrieve a revolver and some revolver ammo. You grab those items as long as you're not being stalked because there is a chance by the by that as soon as you leave the save room downstairs by the kitchen that he will just be right in front of you and start stabbing you. That could happen. Or it could happen that, that you make it upstairs and uh, and he's you know at the top of the stairs waiting for you. Or you walk into the bedroom and he just materializes in the doorway behind you and you don't have time to go into the closet. See, what I did um, is I did it wrong. I made it harder on myself when I got to the end of the game. Because I went upstairs, I was being stalked, so I 
open up that closet. He's behind me. I had to run like all the way around the upstairs, keep him trailing behind me. You can't get too far away from him or else he'll turn around and come from the other direction. You have to keep him following you. You see what I mean? Because if you run too fast, then he will turn around and you're going to run straight into him. So you kind of have to do it in a graduated way and pace yourself just right, just so. So he's chasing me. I ran back in on my next go round. I got the revolver. I got the ammo. And then I killed him inside the house, or so I thought. Not really. I had this whole chase sequence with him where I'd run around the top of the, you know, the upper level, run around the upstairs, get him coming at me. And when you go into uh, position to fire at him with the revolver, you know, you have to turn your character around, which is clunky to do. It's not as fast as you'd like it to be. All the while he's walking at you. So you get maybe one to two shots off and then you have to start running again. And I don't remember exactly how many shots it takes to kill him. I feel like it, it might be, I don't know, five to seven ish, something like that. Uh, but he eventually dropped over dead again. So I thought, and then of course, remembering the words of, uh, the mother, they have a second car, but it wasn't gassed up. So you go downstairs, go out back into the backyard. There's a shed that you can open up, you know, cause it's locked. This is where the bolt cutters from downstairs come into play. You open up the shed by cutting the lock off the door with the bolt cutters. You go in, you find a can of gas, and then you head to the left side of the house in the backyard, and there's a door that leads into the garage. Start gassing up the car, and this mofo, who I just killed, who I just had this epic encounter with and barely made it out of alive just thought I killed him he's back for more in true horror movie fashion and uh, and you gotta do this fight all over again I had one hit left when when he died in the garage uh, I was already low on health I think he stabbed me once while we were in the garage, if I would have been hit one more time, that would have been it. And I would have had to, I would have had to go back to an unfortunate save spot. Because when I saved for the third time, you see, um, I had not, I think it was, what was it? I think it was the upstairs key that I had accidentally left in the basement. So from my last save, I had to go back into the basement, get that fucking key, then make it upstairs and unlock the door up there into the bedroom and then get the revolver and the revolver ammo. I had to do all that without dying once. Otherwise, I would have been sent back to my last save file. And that's why the ending of this really was um, testing my metal, really tested my patience. And it was partially due to my um, my unfortunate decision to save the game where I did. Anyway, I uh, barely scraped by him in the garage. I mean, the last shot that I hit on him, I think he was just about to, to slash me up. You can watch it and see how close it was. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and that's that. So the big takeaway for you should be if you decide to play this game, when you get the revolver, you get the ammo, head outside immediately. Don't worry about trying to put him down inside the house. Just run away from him, get outside, get the gas can and start gassing up the car and then he's going to come after you again. That's, that's the fight you have to worry about. And it's close quarters. 
it's a small little garage which is another thing that that makes it extremely difficult an extremely difficult uh, boss fight is how close he is to you all the time so it's like you run from one corner to the other turn around shoot one time basically and he's already on your ass and he's slashing at you and you have to like just make it past him because you only have like half the garage to work with there's a car on the other half so it is extremely difficult i'm sure that if you if you practiced it and you got really good at it you could get a system going where you could become an expert just like with any other game but i'm speaking as uh you know someone who did not do that if you're going into this game fairly blind you haven't done it before and you get to that ending you're probably going to die a few times until you work out a system for yourself that at least allows you to scrape by but it is not an easy thing to do pretty fucking tough so that's uh that's that one and another cool little bit of trivia that i found out was babysitter bloodbath was actually originally a halloween game and you can find a playthrough of that you can find many i'm sure on youtube i stumbled upon one is how i found out about this but uh originally it was a halloween game starring michael myers instead of the killer that you end up facing in the uh, modified version the new version that's allowed to be distributed online i guess there were some legal issues that came up some copyright shit so uh, puppet combo or back then pig farmer games had to modify it put a fresh coat of paint on it take away all the halloween references and music and change the killer up a little bit but you can still tell it's basically michael myers and and obviously the story is very reminiscent of the original halloween being a babysitter and uh you know and all that kind of stuff but uh check out some gameplay of the halloween version because it's pretty cool there are halloween decorations up in the house you know and there's pumpkins around uh, or jack-o'-lanterns and you get the halloween music it's uh you know it's a little bit different experience so that's kind of neat uh and that's you know that's uh that's that for the games i played this week or last week i'm gonna give my game of the week for last week to blood wash congratulations uh congratulations go out to blood wash just had a lot going on surprised me with the depth and the charm i love p paul i love p paul's store just a big fan of that game so game of the week congrats blood wash and that's that for games uh before i go i wanted to bring up one more thing a little comic book action i haven't been reading much in the way of comics recently other than you know uh shiro stuff apple seed and black magic mostly getting ideas for the book that i'm working on strawberry blonde i'll talk more about that in a moment but i finally received a new book in the mail from something that i ordered a while back off etsy this is a peter a deluca jam called uzi Susie. if you'd like to follow peter on twitter you can do so at aka pad peter is one of the hardest working comics gate dudes out there um he is just always posting videos always posting new art that he's working on um i don't know if i see anyone more prolific on twitter in the sort of 
CG scene. Uh, he is just criminally underrated too because he has a really cool style. It's very unique. And I was excited to receive these Uzi Susie books in the mail. He also sent them in a nice custom package. There was like artwork on the mailer. You get the main character, Uzi Susie. She's kind of dressed up like a post woman. What does she say? She says, uh, you got mail, sugar. You know, Uzi Susie right there on the mailer in full color. So that's neat. I, I love seeing that effort put into projects, put into the presentation of the package how you're shipping stuff out to people, you know, it's, it's important. So I got these, uh, premier issues of Uzi Susie urban violence. It's the same book on the inside, but two different, uh, two different exteriors with different cover art. I got the first ever dirty pink edition and the green with envy edition. So the, the, uh, Dirty Pink Edition is a pink cover, and the Green with Envy is a green, sort of day glowish type on each of those. And, um, you know, it's all black and white interiors. Kind of, kind of messy, scribbly, indie art looking stuff. But he's got a very unique style, and he's got a very unique approach to the way that he draws his characters. I don't really know exactly what to compare it to, which is good. You know, when you uh, can have a kind of you factor, it's recognizable when people see your artwork and they're like, Oh, that's, that's old Peter DeLuca. I know right there from the way that face looks or the way that the, the body is drawn, sort of the angular approach. Uh, you know, other artists do that, but there's a particular way that he does it that, that I think is pretty neat. So anyway, um, Uzi Susie was originally conceived of as a hobo with a shotgun spinoff and later to emulate the rawness of Toxic Avenger RoboCop, RoboCop 2, Scanners, Turbo Kid, and They Live. She is the bad biatch of Crud City, is Uzi Susie. And um, there's a little blurb on the inside of the book that I thought was kind of neat. Gives you some background on how this book was created. Uh, Peter writes, I've long been a fan of Scott McCloud's 24-hour comic book challenge and was fascinated by a similar test, the 12-hour mini comic book challenge thanks to instagram user and artist at tunes by troy i was inspired to obsessively learn about the mini comic art form captivated by this format i was compelled to get involved along the way i added in some conditions to this challenge in order to maintain a consistent art direction while growing as an artist and craftsman uzi suzy was completed with the following boundaries 90 minutes to draw and letter each page. Hand letter the page. Erase as little as possible. Create on the page as much as possible. And finally, stay true to speed and spontaneity. So um, those were sort of the conditions that he wrangled himself into and created this first issue of Uzi Susie, which is a mini comic, you know, kind of ash can size, like five and a half by eight and a half. And uh, it's about Uzi Susie, the titular character. Second time I've used that word in this podcast today, titular. Susie basically was, um, she was uh, kind of coerced into the prostitution scene, uh, scene to protect her younger sisters. She told the Mac, the kind of big Mac daddy pimp, that I'll work for you. 
as long as you leave my sisters alone and you don't uh, force them into this life. As she got a little bit older and wasn't bringing in as much income, the Mac Daddy went back on his word and recruited her two younger sisters into that life, uh, which did not sit well with Uzi Susie. And she turned on the boss, tried to let him have it, and was uh, promptly dispatched by the boss and his goons, thrown into the water to swim with the fishes, as they say. She's down there drowning. She notices a knife cuts herself free and also sees a bag full of Uzis, of guns that she can use. And she, uh, you know, comes to the surface with a spirit of vengeance. And that's pretty much where issue number one leaves off. So uh, there you go. So it's a neat little, a neat little comic book, just a primer. As I said, it's a mini comic, but he jammed a lot of art in here, quite a few panels for such a small book. I don't know how many pages we got here. What is this? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, four. About what are they, like 12, 14 pages. So uh, check out Uzi Susie. Go and follow Peter on Twitter at AKA Pad. If you go to his um, his profile in his profile description, you can uh, or his bio as they call them, I think on Twitter, you can get to his link tree. And from there, you can check out all of his different social media shits. He's got a podcast you can check out. He's got his Etsy store. Uh, he's got Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. And he's constantly creating and he's constantly drawing and, and interacting with people. So check out Peter. Give him some love and support. Check out Uzi Susie and the other projects that he has going on and also it's that time of the podcast for me to tell you what stuff of mine to check out other than your youtube other than your uh you know your videos that you're you're watching other than this podcast what else do i have going on um you can follow me on twitter at the super divorce posting on there daily i always try to follow up my gameplay videos with a link to said video and also you know like four screenshots from the game always posting those on twitter and i kind of repeat those posts on instagram if you're more of an instagram user you can follow me on the gram at super divorce band Super Divorce Band on uh, on uh, Instagram and The Super Divorce on Twitter. Also, if you head over to superdivorceme.com, you can check out Super Divorce Music. Music. Two musical albums that you can listen to right now. Most recent one was called Action Figures. That came out in 2017. I am working on new material now but until the new stuff comes out please check out action figures it's uh 10 songs of just synth pop radiance just synth pop perfection <clears throat> 2017's greatest pop album so check that out at superdivorceme.com and uh also there's another album there called Wish You the Best. If you're a fan of music of a little bit different speed, it was the very first Super Divorce album with a different lineup when it was a four-piece post-hardcore band. Um, another full-length album that you really might enjoy if you check it out. Try it. Give it a shot, please. 
you can do that there at superdivorceme.com or if you prefer to listen to your tunes on Spotify or Apple Music on Amazon wherever you like to go for your streaming shit just search up Super Divorce and uh, and give uh, Super Divorce a little bit of your ear time as far as your tunage goes I think you'll like what you hear I hope you do okay I do <clears throat> also if you're listening to this on YouTube and you have not done so yet please subscribe to the channel like this video comment below if you got anything to say uh, tell your friends to check it out tell your friends to check out some of the gameplay vids comment on any of those that you'd like to anytime you have a question a comment a concern a request if you have a request for a game you'd like me to play you can always tell me about it and I'll check it out I have filled several of those in the past so uh, hit me up in the comments section on YouTube or you know comment section on uh, Twitter on a post you can just at me if you'd like to whatever I'm pretty easy to get a hold of in that respect so just uh, search me up on your platform of choice and say hello also if you're a fan of this podcast you can check this out on Spotify on iTunes on all those other streaming platforms we got the Super Divorce Supercast there for you to listen to separate uh, channel though you know so if you follow Super Divorce on Spotify and you want to hear the podcast as well make sure that you look up the Super Divorce Supercast on Spotify and uh, go to that page and sub there or on iTunes like I said wherever you prefer I appreciate you and that's just about it for today so thank you very much for listening I hope you have found the rundown of all these games to be informative and entertaining and I hope that you will join me again next week Okay, my friends, so until next time, take real good care, keep kicking ass, love you lots, Lord willing, I'll be back very soon with another video, another podcast, or something for you to watch or listen to. Bye-bye.